This video is a continuation of my last one. It makes more sense if you watch that one first. We all know the meme that's gonna happen. You know what meme I'm talking about. You absolutely know what meme I'm talking about that one. May, may. Unless you are the Mongols. <laughs> There are few themes of nomadic empires. When they come from the unity of the peoples themselves, like the Huns, Scythians, Sarmatians, Xiongnu, or they can come from the unity brought by a huge military advantage, like the Proto-Indo-Europeans or the Comanches, or they can come from a great leader, like with the Mongols. But great is a little bit subjective now, isn't it? So, uh, Mongols. They come from Mongolia, and this place is wild. Really, it's not very developed. It's hard to do that when it's super inland and has such extreme temperatures. This region, which doesn't really look like this in the 1200s, more like this, is high in elevation, dry, super cold in the winter, and super hot in the summer, with unpredictable rains and frosts. So, not so good for agriculture. But extreme blizzards and droughts can kill off bunches of livestock just like that. So this area is definitely not one for many plants, but don't worry, grass has got this. So if you can farm animals that have tough digestive systems to eat grass, you're a nomad, yeah we get it. Mongols, Mongols, Mongols! Mongols, Mongols. The Mongol people were a large group that lived on the eastern portion of the Eurasian steppe. They were decentralized and fought among each other, and with the other steppe peoples, like the Turkic Uyghurs and Tatars. The Mongols grew sheep, cows, horses, camels, and goats and would follow the normal cycles of transhumance peoples, probably sticking by rivers or ponds for water. The people spent their normal days hunting, herding, traveling, and doing shamanistic rituals, like flicking fermented horse milk around their yurts, worshipping gods, spirits, and ancestors at these mound altars called ovos, and also partying at the Lunar New Year. Mongolian horses, which were small, sturdy, and logistically easy to handle, were revered and thought sacred, so it's easy to see why this is a vibrant culture. People would learn and create epic oral poetry, just like those famous Greek bards did, and many kept large family trees that show their clan history. And then spicy boy Genghis Khan came along and really hit the reset button on Asia. It'd be kind of like... Imagine if by 2039, North Macedonia retook the conquests of Alexander. It would be a little bit like that, I think. Big Chungus Khan was an extraordinarily bright and adaptive person. He defeated his old friend Jamaka to become the leader of the Mongol people, and thereby proved that meritocracy is better than inherited nobility. With united highly organized army of steppe tribesmen sorted into ethnically diverse squads, the Mongols swarmed through most of Asia, as long as the loot was good and their strategies worked. The Mongols loved to fake a retreat, then turn around and shower arrows into their enemies. They also made extensive use of hostages, meat shields, biological warfare, and just swarming the enemy army out. Genghis and his army were crazy resourceful. Whenever Genghis Khan faced a new challenge, like walls, he adopted and experimented with whatever would work, like siege equipment and the environment. Although, experimenting with rivers is tricky business because sometimes you wash out the entirety of your own camp. <laughs> Obviously, we can't say that the Mongols were invincible, but especially for the people at the time, it sure seemed like they were. The Mongols weren't some far-off threat. The people were terrified of them. Should they remain loyal to their local leader? Could they be protected from the horsemen? The short answer is probably not. And if you resisted the conquest, your home would be destroyed, your family killed, and your life ruined or ended. Yes, the Mongols were awesome. But think of the suffering that they caused. The atrocities that the Mongols committed were not unheard of at the time, but they were just on a much larger scale. They did help the Mongols take so much land, but an empire forged from pure military might leaves a lot of dead bodies behind that. A lot of dead bodies. So do the ends justify the means? Well, what ends? The Mongol Empire connected the different parts of its territory, preserved law and order, and taxed goods. This means the overland routes of the Silk Road were back and better than ever! Spreading goods, ideas, Marco Polos, and diseases between the West and the East. 
The Mongols also had a really good messenger system called the Yam. Yam? Yam. Where outposts of horse riders were set up to go really fast. Mongol law, called the Yasa, was expanded to the territory of the empire. It aimed to establish obedience to the Great Khan, unity of the nomadic clans, and brutal punishment for wrongdoing. All of this was overseen by Genghis Khan himself, and his judges, though spicy Genghis Temachingis Jin Khan, wouldn't write it down, or even let anyone learn the Mongol language. As long as everyone behaved themselves, they were granted religious tolerance. There was also heavy record keeping, royal advisors of many ethnic backgrounds, and unimaginable wealth flowing into the Mongol homeland. There was also the forced migration of engineers, scribes, and anyone else useful to the Mongols, and the killing off of any aristocracy that may have resisted them. But the Empire fell for the oldest trick in the book. Never get involved in a land war in Asia. It got too big. Ruling such a vast and diverse area is hard. Really hard. So when they stopped conquering and Genghis Khan's grandsons had a few civil wars over who should rule the Empire, it split into four sections between them. A guy named Kublai Khan won, and he got the best allotment, Mongolia and China. His dynasty worked as kind of the same highly centralized dynasty that the Chinese were used to, so of course they eventually became corrupt and were overthrown by the Ming. Those in the Golden Horde settled down into its territory and ran their empires as overlords, where the local rich boys had some power, but the Mongols played them off each other and always changed their alliances to keep them weak until the local princes became Russia. So, check off that one. The Chagodai Khanate is mostly pastoral grasslands, so not much happening here, except for infighting and more civil wars. The Il Khanate, easily my least favorite one just because of its stupid name, picked up Persia's administrative practices, but with the Mongols on top now. They eventually integrated into Persian society, allied with France to fight the Mamluks in Egypt, and disintegrated after a succession crisis. Of course, the Mongols aren't the only interesting nomadic group out there. They just happen to be the largest. And there are so many other nomadic groups I could tell you about, like the Comanche in America, who would plant for part of the year and nomadically hunt for the rest, until they got Spanish horses. Then they came to dominate the plains through trading and raiding with both Europeans and other natives. Of course, this power doesn't last very long when the United States' destiny is manifested through the Great Plains and into Mexico. Yikes. Or the Sami reindeer herders who raise reindeer and that is so- Or how about the Proto-Indo-Europeans? Classic. The nomadic group from the Ukrainish land that first domesticated horses and used them to take over like to a lot of places. Or the Bedouins who raid each other, but in a well-regulated and honorific fashion, which I don't know what that means. Not one source could tell me. If any of you are Bedouin, hit me up. The most famous fictional nomads are George Double R. Martinez's Dothraki. In my opinion, the Dothraki are a uh, pretty vanilla nomad warrior warrior society. Nothing Dothraki really deviates from what goes on in the real world. It's just kind of cranked up to 11. The steppe they're from is called the Dothraki Sea, which is split up not by territory, but by the people which form large nomadic chiefdoms called Khalisars. These groups seek pasture for their horses and to make a sizable living raiding surrounding powers. And so it's a warrior society, where strength and violence are often king. They fight on horses in pretty much the same way that the Mongols did, have these cool swords called Arachs that are good on horseback, and they only cut their hair when they lose a battle. So being a leader with short hair is shame. Their culture is very horse-oriented because of how important horses are to their lives. This permeates their religion, language, iconography, and all that. He's not such a hisha, citizen. And there's only one real city, Vais Dothrak, which is a hub of trading between the Khalasars and outsiders. The Dothraki are pretty awesome, until they charge into battle without any real tactics, losing instantly, even when you have magic swords. And that's it on nomads, empires, and their tribes. I hope you guys enjoyed these videos. It was kind of a mess, and I do apologize for splitting it into two, but it was necessary, I swear. Hoppity hoppity, this is how the video ends. There's no joke after this.